This is Mazen Kerala Infectious Disease and Critical Care Medicine. Today is the, the 7th of April 2020. This is a pathophysiological approach to severe cases of COVID-19. What we know about the disease that uh, the virus attaches to S2 receptors uh, through the spike protein and gets into the uh, cells to replicate. The end result would be acute lung injury with vasoconstriction and vascular permeability. This happened through different effects uh, between the AT2 and AT1. What we know is the angiotensin attaches to uh, AT1 and causes vasoconstriction, proliferation, inflammation, and fibrosis. At the same time, S2 converts angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 1 and 9 exerts effects on uh, AT2 with vasodilatation, anti-proliferation, anti-inflammation, and anti-fibrosis. So you can see those uh, effects are uh, opposite to what AT1 would do. There are other effects also of different compounds, but we don't want to complicate the picture. It's essentially imbalance between the AT1 and AT2 in this disease. S2 receptors uh, are present in different organs, mainly the lungs, the heart, kidneys, the brain, and testicles. That's why we have manifestations in the lungs, uh, cardiac toxicity, uh, kidney injury, and uh, brain involvement with uh, different uh, manifestations. We have not seen yet whether there are uh, manifestation on the testicles or not. We know also that the disease may be uh, uh, having different patterns and courses. We've seen the hyperacute uh, uh, cases where patients come with uh, severe hypoxemia and respiratory distress, leading to immediate intubation and mechanical ventilation and possibly death. We also have seen uh, indolent course uh, of the disease with moderate hypoxemia and moderate uh, wor work of breathe. Patients may get uh, better over uh, days or maybe uh, over weeks. At the same time, we've seen uh, a biphasic uh, course that uh, uh, patients start with uh, indolent course, uh, followed uh, usually on day number five or seven, uh, by uh, five to seven by acute deterioration and hyperinflammation and the disease uh, manifests uh, in its severe uh, uh, state. We also have observed uh, that uh, uh, patients may have uh, the same uh, severe hypoxemia with the same uh, uh, PF ratio but have different uh, uh, chest x-ray findings, it could be minimal findings on the chest x-ray compared to other patients with severe findings and bilateral infiltrates consistent with uh, uh, ARDS-like picture. CT scan of the chest, uh, uh, most of the time would show gra ground glass opacities, mainly at the peripheries. It may progress into localized uh, uh, consolidation or even bilateral uh, infiltrates or consolidations. We uh, hypothesize that uh, uh, different uh, factors may uh, dictate on the patterns of this uh, uh, COVID-19 presentation. These uh, factors could be, uh, number one, the severity of the infection itself, the host response, uh, physiological reserve of the patient and comorbidities, uh, uh, hypertension, uh, cardiac disease, diabetes, and so forth. The second factor, which is most important for uh, to understand for the management uh, of those patients would be the ventilatory responsiveness of the patient to the hypoxemia. How did the patient respond to hypoxemia? And we will elaborate more on this. And the third factor would be the time elapsed between the onset of the disease and the observation in the hospital. So this, uh, those patients who present with hyperacute uh, uh, course uh, or pattern uh, may have uh, presented to the hospital at late time. They had the indolent course at home and they did not seek medical attention. 
So those uh, uh, factors are actually uh, taken from uh, the uh, article that will be published uh, very soon uh, at the Intensive Care uh, Medicine Journal by uh, Dr. Gattinoni and his colleagues. Most of the uh, information that I'm going to present today is uh, actually taken from this uh, article. The disease uh, has a, a high mortality rate in the intensive care unit. Uh, this is the uh, uh, most uh, recent uh, uh, articles that were presented about the uh, clinical characteristics of these uh, uh, patients. Uh, and if we take a look on uh, those uh, articles, you will see that uh, four of them are in the intensive care unit. 100% of those patients are in the intensive care unit. And you can see the mortality rate uh, range uh, from 50% uh, to 67%. Uh, in the Italia study here, the mortality rate is 26%. However, 58% uh, of patients were still in the intensive care unit at the time of publication. Cardiac injury has been seen in about one third of the cases. Uh, one American study did not uh, show any cardiac injury in those patients. Shock has been seen around uh, uh, 35 to 70 percent of the cases and uh, uh, invasive mechanical ventilation uh, from uh, 42 percent to 75 uh, percent. Uh, even in the uh, Italian study, uh, it, uh, the invasive mechanical ventilation was about uh, 88 uh, percent. They are indicators of high uh, risk of uh, progression. Uh, uh, mainly uh, would uh, be the age and the comorbidities as listed here. Uh, one of those uh, uh, vital signs, uh, uh, respiratory rate more than 24, heart rate more than 125, or saturation less than 90. And uh, uh, lab, one of those of these laboratory uh, factors or findings, D-dimers more than, <clears throat> more than 1,000, CK more than twice upper limit of normal, CRP more than 100, LDH more than 245, elevated troponin, admission absolute lymphocyte count less than 0.8, and ferritin more than 300. If we have one epidemiological factor plus one from vital signs or from labs, this would indicate that this patient is at high risk of progression. So it looks like we are not dealing with uh, a typical ARDS, and this has been described by Dr. Gattinoni uh, in an article that was published uh, in the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine, where uh, he uh, described that uh, those patients uh, may present with uh, ARDS-like picture uh, even after the uh, uh, seven-day uh, limit uh, of the Berlin's criteria. These patients may take seven to 10 days uh, or even uh, sometimes uh, longer before they get into uh, this uh, severe disease. Uh, the other thing which was atypical about uh, this presentation is the uh, uh, compliance that was noticed to be uh, normal in a good percentage of those uh, patients. Uh, you can see here that uh, uh, those patients had a compliance above 50, but at the same time uh, they had uh, a good percentage of, percentage of shunt uh, process within the lungs, uh, uh, which is responsible for their severe hypoxemia. When they uh, uh, compared the shunt fraction uh, to the uh, fraction of gasless tissue, uh, it was 3.0 as opposed to uh, 1.25 in typical ARDS, indicating that what we have is uh, remarkable hyperperfusion of gasless uh, tissue. They concluded that uh, COVID-19 pneumonitis is not equal to ARDS. Here, uh, what I'm going to describe is the different uh, uh, pathophysiology that we know and uh, uh, the uh, radiological uh, mechanical presentations uh, of those patients. In terms of the physiological uh, abnormalities, what uh, we uh, uh, know so far that uh, it is mainly a dysregulation of pulmonary uh, perfusion. Uh, it is uh, the abolishment of uh, the uh, uh, vasoconstriction of the lungs. 
that's why we have a higher perfusion compared to ventilation so those patients would present with VQ mismatch on the expense of higher perfusion they may form uh, micro uh, thrombi and that would be responsible for uh, a dead space disease and uh, when they progress into a severe disease uh, they may have uh, ARDS uh, like picture with uh, collapse uh, collapses in the in some of the lung segments and the main uh, pathophysiology would be shunting we also know that this virus has a neurotropism and uh, mainly the midbrain uh, those patients may present with uh, uh, cognitive uh, uh, problems uh, there is usually dissociation between the work of breathe and the perception of the shortness of breath and this is very important in terms of the uh, management of those patients and the possibility of progress into severe disease and we will talk about it there are some cases with cardiorespiratory arrest that may uh, be uh, uh, caused by the midbrain involvement of the virus those patients uh, have a percentage of delirium and percentage of uh, uh, anosmia radiologically they manifest as we mentioned with localized infiltrates mainly ground glass opacities or it may be diffuse infiltrates and consolidations and mechanically uh, they have uh, one of uh, uh, two conditions or categories uh, they may present with low elastance uh, low vq uh, low lung weight uh, low recruitability and uh, low peep uh, response or they may present with severe disease where it is characterized uh, by high elastance uh, high vq uh, or higher vq uh, high uh, lung weight, uh, high recruitability, and uh, high uh, PEEP response. So if we look at it this way, so you can understand what we mean by all this, we start from this as uh, a main issue uh, at the lung, uh, uh, at the pulmonary vasculature, uh, where we have dysregulation of pulmonary perfusion, or abolishing the vasoconstriction this will result into a VQ mismatch mainly with more perfusion than ventilation as a result of the uh, hypoxemia patient will uh, start uh, having increased work of breathe but at the same time because of the neurotropism there's increased respiratory drive which we would be accounting for an increased uh, work of breathe for this patient and the way what they breathe they may take a large tidal volume and they increase the strength and strain so this would actually cause uh, patient self-inflicted lung injury in addition to the uh, direct injury of the uh, virus causing acute lung injury we may have an increased elastance uh, load on the lungs and the patient has to work harder in order to overcome this increased elastance at the same time we've seen micro uh, thrombosis occurring in the lung uh, vasculature not systematically uh, and this would be accounting for a change in the vq uh, ratio on the expense of more dead space disease with the thrombosis we should not forget also that there's increased metabolic demand uh, caused by the sepsis and all this will put more demand on the on the work of breathe the main issue here that uh, those patients will exert uh, uh, more efforts to breathe and the transpulmonary pressure will be huge causing more uh, stress and strain on the alveoli leading to more uh, uh, patient self-inflicted lung injury eventually ARDS like picture So it looks like it's a vicious cycle starts with impaired gas exchange and long elastance uh, uh, goes into increased uh, respiratory drive uh, causing uh, self-inflicted lung injury and uh, large esophageal swings uh, uh, and tracheal pressure leading to capillary leak and more lung edema that causes more uh, impaired gas exchange and long elastance and if we want to simplify this uh, 
Dr. Gattinoni described two different uh, uh, patterns or phenotypes of the disease uh, based on the uh, pathophysiology. Uh, if we have hypoxemia here, we can differentiate between either uh, early on as dysregulation of pulmonary perfusion. This is uh, mainly uh, represented by normal lung gas, uh, loss of hypoxic vasoconstriction, and loss of regulation of perfusion. Those would be uh, uh, described as phenotype uh, L, which is low, stands for low. Those patients would have low elastance. Uh, there's not much uh, of the lung edema yet. It's only pulmonary vasodilatation. That's why we have a low VQ. The Q here is uh, increased. Uh, since we don't have a uh, lung edema, the uh, lung uh, weight is low uh, and uh, they do not uh, respond to uh, uh, recruitment uh, maneuvers uh, and they uh, would not respond to high PEEP. In fact, they, they need only low PEEP. On the other hand, we have the pulmonary edema collapse ARDS-like uh, picture uh, uh, where we have, uh, we call this uh, as phenotype uh, H or high stands for high elastance, uh, high right to left uh, shunt, high lung uh, weight uh, and higher recruitability uh, uh, with high PEEP uh, response. Patients uh, can uh, uh, progress from uh, phenotype L to phenotype H uh, dependent on the severity of the disease, the depth of intrathoracic uh, pressure, as we mentioned earlier, uh, and the increased tidal volume would be responsible for that, which lead to increased interstitial lung edema and patient self-inflicted uh, lung injury. We know that 20 to 30 percent of cases would manifest as uh, phenotype H as com uh, compared to the remaining patients would be phenotype L. And this is in the same article, uh, the same patient has progressed uh, from phenotype A to phenotype B. And you can see on the right side here that uh, the PF ratio was almost the same. So the patient was hypoxemic uh, with PF ratio of 95. Uh, and you can see this CT scan that has this uh, ground glass appearance that progressed within seven days to this appearance with PF ratio of uh, 84 uh, uh, millimeter mercury. This is uh, the uh, uh, Hounsfield uh, units uh, on the CT scan indicating more air here compared to this uh, uh, CT scan here. So in this CT scan, we have well aerated uh, compartments. The total lung weight was uh, almost 1100 grams, 7.8% uh, uh, was not uh, aerated, uh, so it's only a small percentage, and the gas volume was more than 4 liters. Uh, in the second uh, CT scan, there was a shift to the right with non-aerated compartments, you can see that those areas are not aerated. Uh, total long weight was 200, uh, 2744. So the lung weight was much higher because of the edema. 54% uh, of the uh, uh, alveoli were not uh, aerated uh, and gas volume was only 1360 milliliter. So this is the progression between phenotype A and phenotype, uh, uh, I'm sorry, phenotype L and phenotype H. In terms of the management, uh, it is uh, now important to understand uh, the different uh, phenotypes uh, so we can manage those patients uh, uh, effectively. And uh, we need to go through five different stages, uh, starting with the long, with the shunt fraction, and then uh, assessing the risk for uh, patient self-inflicted lung injury. Then uh, we uh, do phenotype screening by checking the strain and then we identify the phenotype of the patient. And then if uh, there's no response uh, to treatment, we escalate uh, therapies. So the first step is to uh, estimate the shunt. Uh, we do that simply by just putting the patient on 15 liters of nasal cannula and assess the SpO2 response. 
If we see a saturation above 95%, that is a good response, and this uh, would be a mild uh, uh, shunting process. If, on the other hand, the uh, SpO2 does not go above uh, 95%, that is uh, uh, a severe, uh, moderate or severe shunting uh, process. And you can see here that uh, the mild uh, cases uh, would easily improve uh, the PO2 uh, would improve uh, remarkably uh, with uh, increasing FiO2, indicating that the shunt fraction is uh, lower. As compared to the severe cases where uh, increasing FiO2 for the patient would not in increase the PO2 remarkably, and that would indicate a higher fraction of uh, shunting. The next question would be uh, whether we should uh, uh, do CPAP non-invasive versus intubation. And uh, if the patient is on uh, FiO2 of more than 40%, uh, in order to determine whether this patient can go on non-invasive mechanical ventilation or face mask, what we do is we assess the work of breathe. There are different ways to assess the work of breathe if the patient is not on the ventilator. Ideally, we would like to have esophageal manometry. But if it's not present, we can actually estimate uh, the intrathoracic pressure from the swings on the, on the CVB. And if it's not uh, uh, placed in the subclavian, we can uh, have a clinical detection of excessive respiratory efforts. In general, if that uh, swings in the pressure is less than 10 centimeters of water, that would be considered low work of breathe, and you may trial CPAP trial or face masks for those patients. In contrast to a uh, intrathoracic pressure of more than 15 centimeters of water, that would be considered high work of breathe and those patients would be intubated. If the patient is intubated, you can assess the work of breathe based on the P.1 second. Now on the other side here, if the patient is uh, having low work of breathe, you can try CPAP, uh, face mask, or even non-invasive uh, a ventilation, but you should know that those would be uh, the non invasive mechanical ventilation would be an aerosol producing or generating procedure, and the patients uh, should be in negative pressure room. If we do this, it would require continuous monitoring of work of breathe to assess whether the patient needs to be intubated or not, and it should be on also for limited time. So you can monitor this patient for the next hour or so and see if they are improving. If not, you would go over there and intubate the patient. At any time you notice that the work of breathe is increasing, you would just intubate that patient as soon as possible. The next step is to determine phenotype uh, screen uh, or you need to assess the strain. And we do this by uh, checking the driving pressure. Once those patients intubated, what we do is volume control ventilation, and you don't need to need uh, to give uh, 6 ml. You can give 8 ml per kg of ideal body weight. The beep can be set initially at 8 cm of water, and you can adjust the respiratory rate for the entire CO2. Your targets would be SpO2 90 to 94%, the uh, PO2 uh, 60 or more, the VCO2 uh, uh, less than... Uh, 45 uh, uh, millimeter mercury or pH more than 7.30. The plateau pressure is less than 28 centimeter of water. And then you assess the driving pressure. If the driving pressure is less than 15 centimeter of water, at that time you can keep the tidal volume at 8 ml per kg of ideal body weight. That means those patients do not have uh, a problem with the lung compliance and uh, they uh, can benefit from a larger tidal volume. If the driving pressure is not less than 15, at that time, you would reduce the tidal volume to 6 ml per kg uh, of ideal body weight. At this point here, you can minimize fluid, but you need to target fluids as per hemodynamics. So you need to have targets uh, based on uh, hemodynamic uh, profile, and you can uh, minimize uh, fluids accordingly. And then you can identify the phenotype. If the patient is still hypoxemic with FiO2 more than 70%, you can do neuromuscular blockade. 
and you can increase the beep incrementally but we don't uh, we should not go more than 16 and the uh, centimeter of water on the beep and you assess for the compliance if the compliance is more than 40 centimeter of water 40 milliliter per centimeter of water at that time you're dealing with phenotype l and this is a low elastance phenotype if the compliance is more than 40 ml per centimeter of water you're dealing with phenotype h and this is high elastance this would dictate different strategies in terms of management those patients are not necessarily responsive to browning position you may ventilate with higher tidal volume of 8 ml per kg and they may not respond to high beep so the beep should not be more than 8 to 10. as opposed to other uh, patients with phenotype h with a high elastance those patients would probably be uh, prone uh, responsive the uh, higher beep would uh, recruit the lungs and they may respond to recruitment maneuvers you may have to do a different mode of ventilation with abrv the same targets uh, that uh, applied but we aim for uh, uh, driving pressure of less than centimeter less than 15 centimeters of water the last thing that you would do is uh, in case of uh, refractory hypoxemia you want to assess whether your patient is ECMO candidate or not if the patient is not responding to proning position or APRV or any other mode of mechanical ventilation for more than six hours or even soon, sooner in life-threatening cases you would uh, screen the patient for ECMO if it is available and if the patient is candidate you would uh, discuss whether he would need a VV ECMO or VA ECMO depending on the hemodynamic profile or if the patient is not a candidate you would just discuss uh, goals with the family with this I would like to conclude uh, and end this presentation and I would be more than happy to answer any questions again all this information is coming from the knowledge that was presented by Dr. Catinoni uh, in the article that I mentioned in the uh, Intensive Care Medicine Journal. Thank you.